Hola Vanessa, ¿todo bien? Hola, hello, hello Néstor. Hello everyone, we will start in a few minutes, ok? Primitive uh, water governance is related to command control. That is a typical fragmented uh, model that exists in a constellation of institutions, stakeholder organization without any coordination uh, space. Uh, and in, in, in the case of uh, several countries of Latin America, uh, actually right now you can identify uh, a transition between this model, the command control, to the integrate uh, water management. Uh, exist, of course, several reasons about the persistence of this fragmented model related to um, conflict in the land use, um, uh, uh, divergences about the main uh, purpose of the ecosystem services that supply the water ecosystem, but one of the key, key reasons I believe that is related to the education, educational system at secondary and tertiary level, that uh, in our case predominate the typical reductionist uh, paradigm, and this is a, an, an, a critical barrier for analyze uh, complex systems and to incorporate a systemic perspective in the, in the process of the analysis and decision-making process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nestor. And I have another question by Lawrence Carvalho. I don't know if Lawrence would like to, to read. I can do, Vanessa, okay. thank you. Uh, thanks, Nesta. Um, yeah, no, I just wondered whether you've done any modeling of how long you may expect that it will take before the Laguna de Sos will recover and whether that long-term recovery is understood by the people investing <laughs> money, in, money in the work. Hi, Lawrence. Great to see you again for a long time. <laughs> um, well, in, in, the, in the case of this example for Uruguay, it's important to thank you, uh, take into account that is the second uh, water drinking reservoir if you pay attention to the number of the people that uh, supply the drinking water services. In this sense, uh, of course, exists a lot of uh, pressure in order to uh, rehabilitate the, the system as soon as possible. And uh, as uh, in the case of Laguna del Sauce, follow the typical global pattern. Uh, the most critical uh, factor right now is how can control the not uh, point uh, nutrient input related to the agriculture and to the livestock. Is the the same problem everywhere? Uh, and uh, I. In, in the case of Laguna del Sauce, it's quite interesting the transition during the last three or four years that finally the, the, the farmers and the livestock producer uh, integrate the, the basic committee. That was a very, very long process that this guy uh, sit in the, on the same table. It was quite difficult, actually. Yeah. Thanks, okay, yeah. Just getting that that a, that stakeholder group together is is a long process. Yes, of, yes, yes. And, and it's, of course, the, the the limnologists play a key role on this process because supply the, the the basic information and identify the possible alternatives. But uh, it's a part of the story, and 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 the input from people that come from economy, social science, uh, 
even the people that belong to the uh, social psychology is critical. O otherwise, it's impossible to forward or promote a real transformation. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next, the next is uh, from Martin Sodegar. He put in the chat, would you like to, to read? Martin? Okay, hello, Nesta, good to see you. It seems like it's uh, uh, going a bit the wrong way for the quality of the aquatic environment in Uruguay. Will there be more national restrictions in the future to prevent uh, Newton loading from point sources and also the diffuse uh, loading from agricultural areas? Well, it, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's a pleasure to see again, Martin. Um, well, in, in, in the case of, of, of Uruguay, the, the, the eutrophication problem is actually uh, a serious, serious problem as uh, the global uh, scale. But in our case, we must pay attention that we, uh, right now, Uruguay is an, an, uh, is an important transformation of the land use because the agriculture, the forestry of eucalyptus increase a lot. And at the same time, the livestock maintain the same number of cows, but producing a small area than in the past. And at the same time, we have a lot of uh, important change in terms of the climatic variability, especially the rainfall regime. In this sense, we expected a higher pressure of eutrophication the next uh, year, and in this sense, we need to incorporate a, a new practice in terms of nutrient fertilization and uh, um, improve our uh, water governance system, especially try to overcome the, the fragmentation um, related to the control and implementation of the strategy that also exists an incredible fragmentation in, in this uh, dimension, especially between the agriculture ministry and the environmental ministry. Okay, uh, move on to the other question. Chris, uh, Carolina Crisi, would you like to do the, the, the question in the chat? Yes, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Nestor. My question is, is in your opinion, which key changes must acad academy or educational system must face to better contribute to the water management process? Oh, it's a very good question. For me, the, the, the academic uh, sector is a kind of bipolar actor that at the same time, uh, uh, give critical information, promote the transformation of the water governance system, but the bad side of the academic sector is the uh, corporation dynamics uh, that play a key role. You, you must remember the, the last uh, discussion at the university related to the new irrigation law a modification, and you can identify in this discussion the, the corporative interest uh, generated by the different university corporations. In few words, Carolina, I, I believe uh, that the academic sector is, is the typical bipolar actor that help, but at the same time put uh, a lot of problem on the table. And, but, uh, from the uh, good side, I, I for example, uh, highlight, for example, all the interaction that uh, promote the, for example, a more interdisciplinary research, for example, with mathematician or the people that works in uh, atmospheric dynamics that also was critical and was actually promoted by the, the crisis, the water crisis related to the Cylinder of permopsiflo. Uh, the, the crisis uh, play a key role. If it don't exist, nothing change at all. Okay. We move on for the the other the other work. Okay. 
sorry here. So another work is also about management actions, user friendly, predictive tool for water quality management using machine from Carolina Christie uh, from Uruguay. The aim of this paper is to generate accurate predictive tools of water quality couplet to user friendly interface. Uh, they have a very nice uh, data, uh, 17 years of data daily. It's, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, have a, a, a large uh, data size in Laguna del Salsi and have some uh, specific uh, objective like develop accurate predictive machine learning models of water quality and design a user-friendly app to decide the decision makers to represent a tool for water quality prediction, visualization of the dynamic of several variables related to water quality and data storage. So in uh, her presentation, he uh, she put the the how can put the data uh, the data and the, the models and the, some uh, examples of uh, graphical graphical results. Uh, in general, very good models performance uh, strategies to deal with class imbalance high highly improved models uh, results. Uh, some highlights the response variable consid considered were level of chlorophyll A, level of cyanobacterium by volume, the presence and absence of morphology based functional group, and of microcystis aeruginosum. The global accuracy over the test sample was between 78 and 94%. Considering the predictive ability by class, performances were also very good with values over 80%. Uh, models uh, were integrated in the user-friendly app, whereby uh, water managers can obtain water quality. So this is a... so. Uh, just a minute, I think I have a, yeah. have a question. Oh, yes. I check the, the, the Moodle platform and, and have um, a... we have not comments on the platform. I, I suggest to open uh, the, quest, uh, uh, the question yeah. uh, round. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, can I, I will put here. Can I start, uh, Carolina? Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a very nice uh, work. Uh, I would like to know that about the hydrological variables that uh, you consider it in this model. Uh, have a, a, a water level and you have another one. Thank you, Vanessa. Um... Is a uh, only watchable uh, watchable level used uh, as hydrological variable. It's the only one that we have uh, uh, with a long uh, data, uh, with long series series. Um, and yes, we use it a uh, daily watchable level uh, data, and, and this is an input variable to the model. You think the 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 water volume can be used too? Uh, yes, we don't have it, but maybe it can be estimated. This is clearly this is an important uh, variable, um, uh, um, mainly thinking that this uh, um, water source water uh, source system. So mm -hmm. in summer there is a lot of water that is taken from the system uh, to to drinking. So yes, maybe it can be calculated in a direct way from the data that we have mm -hmm. and, and included in the model, uh, it's, it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. But clearly this uh, water level and also maybe oh, the volume, it's an important. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. It's a very nice work. Thank you. 
Laurice Carvalho can read the, the question. Mm -hmm. I am me again, sorry. Um, uh, this follows from Paola Lavrini's talk, actually, I think, in our session. But um, I just wondered, with your model you've developed from the data, can you, is it strong enough to predict the impact of future scenarios, climate scenarios, or, or nutrient loading reductions? Uh, like, uh, thank you very much. Um, like it is designed today, I think that, that no, it's, it's not the objective of these models, but uh, yes, we can make um, the effort. Um, we are now uh, working with um, um, meteorological pronostics, so at least meteorological, but it can be done for large, large time in the future to uh, make predicting model with a great time of anticipation. So maybe we can expand these to uh, future conditions. Yes, it is possible to make it, but it's, it's not exactly the objective of the present models. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. More questions for Christina, Eric? Microphone, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, I have a, uh, of course, this model is, uh, it, uh, it's, a, it's machine learned, so it's dumb. It's, it's, of course, building on the data you have. But if your system is drifting because of the eutrophication, then uh, it has to learn again because it yes. uh, doesn't know what's happening. But uh, mm -hmm. my question is more, what did you do when you tested the model? Did you take the last part of the time series or did you pick out data throughout the time series? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, exactly. What you said the first time is, is true. Uh, we have to, to train the model uh, permanently. Permanently in the future, we have to retrain the model to have an actualized model. But uh, to make the testing, we take uh, randomly a set of of that and that at random not it's not the last part of the time series uh, but, just but to, to represent that, different right? situations yeah but maybe you should try try that also because yeah. it t tells a little bit about if the model is still working well yes it's, it's because a now nice you have a test in, in the, the random data then you should try to make a, a new calibration on the first period and then test it on the last period or something like yes. that to see how robust it is uh, for yes. future predictions also, but that- uh, Yes, yeah. yes, very nice. Thank you very much. Yes, I agree. Mm. It's, a, it's a very quest, very good question, Eric, and nice to see it. Uh, because this system, for example, show an important uh, change related, for example, for the turbidity that we don't understand very well the, 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 the causal mechanism, but it's probably related to the invasion of Limnoperna fortunae. And uh, this is uh, critical because probably modifies some, some pattern that we observed during the last 15 years. And on the other hand, in order to avoid any um, expectation, in the case of Uruguay, probably is the unique example that we can analyze uh, and use this technique because uh, we have information uh, per day, but at the same time exists an important airport located close to Laguna del Sauce and exists an automatic meteorological station. We have no other alternative in Uruguay to combine this approach. No, but it's a very nice study. I agree. So. Thank you. Okay. So, we move on. A minute. Oh, sorry. Okay, the last one. Also, uh, management actions. Lucia Cabrera Lamana from Uruguay, too, and uh, several co authors. The role of buffer zone from for nutrient loading mit uh, mitigation, potential nutrient supply by non-graded necromass, 
So uh, it's about uh, the, the role of the, the buffer zone. It's very important to the ecosystem. Uh, the aim of the, the work is to analyze the, the accumulation of above, above ground plant uh, litter of herbaceous and graminoids present in different types of buffer zone, grassland, 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 native forest, and to estimate its potential contribution of nutrients by the composition under different scenarios of rainfall, humidity, and runoff. So uh, uh, she, she, in the presentation, uh, show that have uh, a remote sensing to uh, work and put nine uh, hypothetical scenarios uh, with uh, two big factors. Uh, factor one about composition influence and factor two about precipitation and the runoff and uh, put some trends uh, scenarios and in conclusion the riparian areas have large amounts of plant litter that could act as a source of nutrients his riparian areas may have a greater buffer potential if management actions were uh, are carried out in order to reduce the plant litter accumulation. Expansion, expansion of the native forest is proposed as a way to reduce nutrient load. So some aspects uh, important, the potential contribution of nutrients by plant and litter de uh, decomposition, taking in, into account our possi possible destinations and their magnitude, and contribution by feces and trapping of cattle. And she put a, a, a question, a final question is very nice. Is management with livestock po uh, positive as a way to mitigate the, contribu the contribution of nutrients? So Lucia, thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have a question in the model a little bit. Uh, it's from Nestor. I will put mm -hmm. here. I will put here, Nestor, and you can do the question. I, I, I can, uh, um, Lucia. Well, I, I can read the the what we include early morning today. Congratulations, very good research and presentation. I can finally see. Uh, a key contribution to begin the design. Uh, strategies for which vegetation cover is the most effective in the buffer zone and what type of management alternative is convenient to carry out in order to promote uh, the effective external control nutrients. Uh, I have a, a methodological question that is not clear for me probably for because I, I uh, see the, the YouTube video early early morning. What was the, the composition process uh, that you um, uh, studied in situ and what was, uh, was the, the, the experimental design? I don't know if you performed some litter bag decomposition experiment or use uh, information from the literature. Well, hello. Hi, Nestor. Nice to see you there. Um, Thank you, Vanessa, for the summary. Um, well, we didn't study the decomposition process itself. You know, uh, we analyzed the accumulation of biomass. And uh, what we did was to compare the amount of living biomass with the amount of litter biomass. Um, the grasses were cut at ground level and then we separate the living biomass and the litter. And after that, we dry it in order to get the dry wet weight. So it would be, would be very convenient to have information about the decomposition in order to know more about um, all the biological, chemical, or physical process that take place during the decomposition process. But well, we didn't. 
Uh, and well, now I, in this video, I present look, um, just the first results. Um, and now to the next is to try to fill the missing information. And well, the decomposition is a topic that we are on discussion on our team. And I don't know, maybe we have to do some decomposition experiments. Let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. I connect with the, the, the um, a previous uh, question of Martin, uh, Martin Sondergar, that uh, this is a, a one, uh, I'm sorry, a new, um, completely new approach in Uruguay, the, the buffer zones that create a, a, in response to other very important drinking water crisis in 2013 that affected the metropolitan area of Montevideo. But very basic aspect, we have no idea how can design this buffer zone, which is the most uh, um, uh, positive combination of plant coverage and how can management this area. In this sense, Lucia, uh, congratulations because it's, a, it's a, a very relevant contribution. Thank you, Nestor. Uh, more questions for, for, for Lucia? No, uh, I, I just uh, ask a little bit about the the scenarios of precipitation, Lucia. Okay, uh -huh. I will put here for you. Uh, why the minimum use it for uh, uh, was forty percent. Uh, well, um, it, it's it's based in the precipitation uh, in the region. Uh, yes, yes, it's um, it's the the lowest um, medium precipitation. Yes, in the region. Okay. So no more question for Lucia. So thank you, Lucia. Very nice okay, work. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Let's move on. Oh, yeah. Okay, another uh, another work. It's very interesting work. It's physical action that uh, promotes a biogeochemical action. So hurricane disturbance stimulates nitrification and altered ammonia oxidizer community structure in Lake Okikobi, sorry the pronunciation, the lake, and St. Lucie Estuary, Florida. Uh, Justina Hempel and the other uh, authors and Sylvia Neal, the professor. So the, the work uh, talk about a long history of cyanobacterium blooms in the two systems and uh, uh, blooms mainly to microcystis and no uh, nitrogen fixing. And in 2016, had a state of emergency bloom. And also, the event, the Hurricane Irma in 2017 in Florida Keys, category four. So the hurricane effects on ecosystems, aquatic systems in increased runoff and nutrient concentrations, nutrients resuspension from sediment, amplification of pre-existing environment issues, uh, and eutrophication. So uh, this, this paper uh, work with the bio geochemical cycle of nitrogen. Uh, research, research workers suggest that comp competition for ammonium between ammonia oxidizer and skin bacteria harmful uh, algae blooms can help determine microbial community stru structure. So uh, 
she put uh, a lot of results. So I put one of them here. It's very, it's very impressive uh, to see the, the increase of uh, nitrification rate post uh, hurricane in the both uh, systems. So some conclusions. Hurricane Irma had a major effect on cyanobacterium blooms in the two uh, systems that were studied. Reduced autotrophic uptake, reduced microcystis abundance. The nitrification rate increased after the hurricane. Reduced competition with cyanobacteria for the substrate and sediment resuspension. The competition between nitrifies and cyan bacterium, uh, like nitrifies outcompete to when the, the bloom was present in 2016 in the both systems, and increased the nitrification rate when there was no bloom. So, uh, in, uh, so the, she put some uh, op uh, open questions. Uh, some of them, which of these groups was responsible for the massive notification rates post hurricane? How quickly the community who uh, would return to the pre hurricane state once the sediment settled? So, very, very nice work and different, Lucina. So, congratulations. So, we have a, a question. No, I'm actually, uh, well, sorry, I just wanted yeah. to say I'm Sylvia Newell, not Justina Hempel. She was my PhD student, but she's moved on to a postdoc. This is her work. I realize it's maybe uh, okay, Sylvia. the best fit, but I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we, you put the, the answer from Nestor did in the in the Moodle system. Nestor, you can, you can read. Yeah. Yeah, I like very much this uh, um, presentation. And I comment that uh, uh, this event, the hurricanes, represent a complete research of the system at all level of organization. The effect study at bacteria community levels and uh, ecosystem processes associated are very relevant. Uh, I have the same question that uh, was put uh, by other participants. How long uh, we, uh, or did you observe this change uh, after the, the, the hurricane? Uh, was a, a short-term effect that uh, uh, you can observe in the system or actually is a, a, a long-term uh, transformation? Well, unfortunately, we weren't able to get funding to go back to look at that. But based on what I know about the system and having worked other places, I assume it didn't last very long. When we were there post hurricane and sampling, the water was so turbid, it looked like chocolate milk it was very difficult to filter. And I think it would probably have taken a few more weeks for everything to fully settle out. But by the next year, the same hab came in. And so you know, I, I think everything was probably back to the status quo at that point. The real difference in Okeechobee is, is less about the hurricanes and more about um, the, we have our Army Corps of Engineers and they control the lake level by flooding it out one side or the other through these long canals to either the uh, Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of Mexico. And the control about whether that goes, um, that is lifted or not, and so the water is able to flow out to the ocean, really controls the extent of the HAB. And so that difference that you saw in, in the St. Lucie estuary of the nitrification rates during the bloom or no bloom, that's really about a management decision more than um, you know, any year-to-year -year variability that's natural. Okay. Maybe I could add a little bit to the, I was in, uh, in Florida at the time, and, and one of the guys that have been looking at the benthic invertebrates, he, he has been looking at several of the hurricanes, and he's, he argued that uh, it'll take up to 10 years for the benthic invertebrates to fully reestablish. 
so so uh, phytoplankton comes back, but some of the benthic processes may be different for a long time period after the hurricane, at least according to his uh, observations. And they had long time shears on the benthic invertebrate, not from this hurricane and not this lake, but another one. That makes a lot of sense. But the, um, I mean, the ammonia oxidizing archaea being, you know, planktonic and floating microbes, they're much more sensitive to what's being, you know, run off from precipitation. They don't rely on that hard substrate at the bottom. So. But, but there can be an effect of the lack of a benthic invertebrate on the nitrogen cycling in True, general. Absolutely. But it's a very nice study, I agree. Mm -hmm. in, in the same way of Eric, I just remember a classic paper that I don't know if also include the same ecosystem that analyzed a um, uh, drastic regime change related to the other or URACAM that promote, eliminate the dominance of submerged plant and promote uh, a phytoplankton uh, dominance and, and last for many, many years, never come back again to the, the submerged plant. I don't remember if uh, uh, which uh, shallow lake from uh, Florida refers, but I try to find to find again. Thank you. Um, one more. So thank you, Sylvia, and congratulations to your student. Is thank seen? you. Okay. So let's move on. So now we pass uh, for chemical techniques. And the first one is from Joseph Davidson and the, and the others. Uh, effects of aluminum sulfate treatment on nutrient dynamics and a plantotrix bloom in a shallow semi-enclosed lake area. So the, the aim of this, this work was exam, uh, examine uh, pre and post treatment, biogeochemical and bi uh, physical chemical conditions in con contrast to the surrounding lake. So this is the lake and uh, here you show that it's semi-enclosure. So, uh, the aluminum application was in April to, uh, um, 20, 20, uh, 20, uh, um, post to the COVID-19, the, the COVID, uh, uh, 2020, uh, the doses, the aluminum was uh, 2,360 uh, kilograms. Uh, the theory that the supply binds the, to the solvent phosphorus, flocculus, uh, sink, and cap sediments, and phosphorus is rendered non bioavailable. So, some conclusions did aluminum reduce uh, the total uh, phosphorus concentration? Uh, this is the, the question, no, sorry. Did uh, aluminum reduce? Uh, harmful algae blooms conditions. Are there any indirect consequences to nitrogen cycle? And the conclusions of this uh, work is the uh, aluminum treatment failed to reduce uh, harmful algae blooms conditions within the enclosure. High oxygen demand contributed to a, few, uh, a fish kill within the lake. The internal nitrogen regeneration and recycle pathways, and some alternative, maybe the uh, 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 wetlands uh, can be constructed. So, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, you are here. Yes. Yeah. Hi, so, thank you. so we have some questions. Yeah. Um, I just want to hear. From Erika Cavalcante. Have you put uh, here first? I, yeah. I, I can put here. here. She, she's, uh, she included in the Moodle platform. Congratulations, very interesting work and presentation. I will, I will like to ask some question. 
how was the dose, uh, the, the concentration of aluminum sulfate, uh, sulfate ap applied? Uh, just to confirm the, the application of aluminum sulfate was only in the enclosure part of the lake, right? Yeah, so uh, the first question um, would basically be uh, determined by the, the private contractor and um, the, the city of Salina that they're working with. That is a good question um, that I honestly don't know uh, the answer to, um, but it should be something that I will check up on in the future. Um, and the second question, yes, the application was only in the enclosed part of the lake. Um, they were trying to get that swimming enclosure back to uh, of safe levels for the general public, um, and they wanted to close it off as much as possible um, and do anything they can, um, aeration, the alum treatment to disperse that bloom, um, reduce the phosphorus levels, and hopefully make it safe for the public. Thank you, Joseph. Another question uh, was in no, the Moodle no. too. It's from Nestor. Nestor, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joseph, thank you for your contribution. The rehabilitation strategy and the combination of responsive analysis are very interesting. I have actually included two main questions. What are the main hypotheses that you consider to explain the, the ineffectiveness of the application of aluminum sulfate in this case was uh, why file and which are the main external nutrient input in this example and also if exists a, a control strategy right now in development or applied. So there are many possible uh, hypotheses for why the alum treatment was ineffective, uh, especially since we've seen that it is effective in uh, many other lakes in the past. Um, one being that the bloom um, was already at a very large size. Um, the phosphorus available in the water column may have already been taken up. Um, and by that time, the aluminum sulfate treatment would have potentially been uh, ineffective. Uh, also, what we're looking at currently, the types of internal phosphorus nitrogen loading um, from the sediments, which could have um, kept that bloom going as much as possible. Um, and then partially to answer your second question as well, um, these external nutrient loadings into this lake are quite extraordinary. Um, this is one of the most uh, polluted lakes in the nation. Um, the watershed, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, is largely agri agricultural, um, very large livestock operations that allow those um, external nutrient loadings, leading to these massive blooms that we've been seeing. Thank you, Joseph. Another you. question uh, from Cielio. Cielio would like to, to read your question. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Hello, Joseph. Hi. Oh, my computer is not working now. But can you hear me? Yes, you, we can hear you. Okay. Now, now, now you appear. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Congratulations on your work, Joseph. It's a very nice, interesting uh, contribution. So my question is related to the, the effects of how aluminum sulfate Affect the other aquatic communities. Do you have an idea? Do you have any samples to show the effects on other communities? Uh, we don't specifically uh, for our research, but there was a paper um, done by um, a researcher in the past 2013 um, where an alum treatment was uh, introduced on Grand Lake. Um, and they noticed that a lot of aluminum was released into the water column um, at potential toxicities to uh, the aquatic um, species that were there. Um, for my research, personally, we don't have um, any data on that. However, we will be um, looking at the aluminum concentration soon uh, to see if any potential effects of that. We did actually look in the water column and um the effects of the treatment were very transient. They were only visible for hours. The pH did drop down to three point something, but it never 
got much lower than that and it bounced back within hours. Same thing, we tried to measure the aluminum concentrations um, free in the water and we could briefly see them, but again, gone, everything gone in hours. So unfortunately, it didn't seem to have much of an effect one way or the other. Yes, yes. The general pattern that I usually see is that the, there is a high amount of aluminum and other coagulants to become efficient, the application of these chemicals. So in, in some cases, there are a huge amount of aluminum covering the bench part of the ecosystem. So I wonder to see how it affects the other aquatic communities especially the bench ones. Thank yeah. you very much for your answers. Thank you for a question. That, that, I mean, that's very important. Um, yes. That uh, the whole purpose is to reduce any type of toxicity. Um, and if we're introducing uh, free aluminum into the system, uh, that's gonna be quite a problem. Yes, and some, some products are active and toxic. So we need to take care with the amount to not reach the toxic levels. Mm -hmm. Anessa, we have a, a, a question from Vera Husa. Hi, Vera, how are you? Hi, and thank you, um, Joseph, for your presentation. Uh, just about the effect of aluminum on biota, there is very few papers about and uh, most of them uh, showed a um, decrease in diversity of any uh, for many communities and uh, of course a removal of cyanobacteria and uh, other groups uh, but the the toxicity of aluminum is um, is made by the monomeric aluminum uh, uh, al3 plus mm -hmm. because this is the toxic uh, species of aluminum and this occurs only uh, in pH before uh, below four so in the water column maybe in the sediment it can be but in the water column it's very difficult to be to have this species of aluminum so we did not expect uh, too much uh, influence in the biota the, at least in the pelagic biota and uh, another is a question for Joseph is about uh, if uh, you performed, did you perform a p-balance uh, of your system? Because the literature says the each lake is one lake. So you need to know how much is entering, how much is, is, is leaving from the system. And then the, what about the recycling, the sediment? And then you can choose the doses to be uh, an efficient removal. Uh, did you perform this? Do you have an idea about how is the P dynamic in your system? Uh, I did not perform um, this analysis. Um, many of this was done um, before I had taken over um, the research. Uh, Dr. Newell could probably elaborate more on that. So this system is a, a man-made dug hole, basically, that they filled in with water back in the 1830s. And there are seven different creeks that come into the lake and only one that leaves it. It was part of the original Erie Canal um, going up to Lake Erie. And so this, um, this system is extremely well-defined in terms of inputs and outputs. Each of the inputs and the out outflows are all monitored. So we do have a very good idea of how much P is coming in that way. Part of Joe's work is going to be important because we're looking at how much actual bioavailable or SRP gets re-released from the sediments. And that's a thing that's not very well known. So that internal recycling is something that he's paying a lot of attention to, which is I think our missing piece. But in terms of external nutrient loads and loss, yeah, we have a really good handle on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vera. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think you have a, a, a comment by Fernanda Monicelli. Uh, Fernanda, you stole my my question. Uh, I, I have to to a question about this the decrease of pH. If the pH you measure the pH, uh, if the pH decrease uh, exactly in the in the line of the Vera Stoke. 
because uh, below four can be toxic for the biota. So do, did you measure? Yes, we do have uh, weekly measurements of pH um, and we do see a decrease, uh, but nothing down to, to a pH of four. Um, we get down to seven and then after a few weeks it drop comes back up to nine. Briefly during the treatment, there was 20 minutes maybe for a got below okay. four. So quickly, no? So quickly, yeah. But yeah. It, it really was buffered very quickly. Okay. So thank you, thank you very much. Very nice uh, work. Thank and you. We, we move on. Okay. So uh, now we talk about uh, three uh, works uh, about geoengineering that have the focus on the, the phosphorus and bio uh, and, and manipulation the bio geochemical process. So the first is the Jose Luciano and the others uh, co-authors combining application of floculants with natural and modified clays as a tool for restoration of an eutrophic reservoir in the semi-arid tropical uh, region. So the it was a microcosm. Uh, scale in tubes. Uh, the hypothesis uh, was the, the algal biomass and total phosphorus will be effectively removed from the water column of Gargalera's reservoir water using a combination of low doses of aluminum sulfate uh, and PEC, uh, polyaluminum chloride, uh, with ballast, uh, like a, a solid phase uh, phosphorus sorbent. Uh, natural bentonite and uh, lanthanum modified uh, bentonite is a commercial clay. So I uh, have three uh, steps. The first one to choose the, um, the doses of the coagulants. The step two, uh, the doses choosing and the test of the ballast. And after the, um, the step three, the best combination, no? Uh, and uh, the conclusions, the application of the low doses of propellant PEC and uh, aluminum sulfate efficiently removes the algal biomass and the total phosphorus from the water of the Gargalera reservoir. The application of nat natural bentonite and the lanthanum modified bentonite as a balance aiming to increase the weight uh, of the flux uh, and formed uh, by the action uh, uh, the action of the flocculants did not contribute to increase the sedimentation of algal biomass and the removal of total phosphorus from water uh, in Gargalera's reservoir. Uh, so I will open oh sorry open to to some questions. Uh, we don't have any question in the in the Vanessa actually Sorry. we we didn't find the Yeah the, I saw it's uh, so stranger yeah exactly we didn't find it to put the question no? <laughs> in this so sense I I saved my comments in in a, in a word file and um, uh, Jose, your presentation was per very good for a lead for me. Your experimental evidence clear demonstrate how each ecosystem is a particular case study, as it's not possible to extrapolate rehabilitation strategy without a sequences of laboratory experiment, mesocops studies, uh, previously to define which will be the, the possible final strategy. Uh, uh, in this sense, I like very much your contribution, and I have a, a question that is from economical perspective. Are important economic difference in the cost of PAC in relation to the aluminum sulfate? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, in our story, we use the, the combination of PAC and aluminum sulfate. I don't know, it's the connecting. 
Jose, I, I recommend that yeah, you uh, turn off your you camera. Can, you can, yeah, you, you, you can turn off the camera, Luciano. I don't know, I think. I will wait a little bit, but let's see. Uh, he 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 lost the connection. So uh, I am uh, co-author in this paper. So uh, I think that the economic um, uh, the truth is not by the economic uh, uh, difference because it's not too big the difference uh, economically. Uh, uh, issues, but it's about we we choose uh, about the pH drop. So normally the pack is more stable with the pH, and normally the aluminum sulfate the the pH uh, decreases a little bit. So this uh, we did the the experiment to see exactly for this. And, and actually, we see this, that uh, aluminum sulfate um, in, uh, decrease the, the pH more than the PET. So economically, I think it's, it's similar, I think, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, actually, it's, for me, it was very unexpected results because uh, uh, only the, 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 uh, the flocculant, the PAC, and, and sulfate aluminum, uh, determine the main effect. Uh, it was completely unexpected for me. You know, uh, I, I, I am reply, Luciano, I reply to the question. So, are you there? Sorry, sorry for my okay. internet connection, okay. So, I, 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 I respond the first question. So, I would like to, Nestor, to do the, the second one. It's a very nice uh, question to Luciano, please. The second one, Nestor. Yeah, the um, I um, sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. Um, mm. Oh, I, I, I have problem with the <laughs> screen. Uh, that's collapse, uh, uh, don't worry. Now, um, uh, Jose, I mentioned to, to Vanessa, I, I don't know if she continued. I, I yeah. think, I think he, he lost again the connection, I think. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's do that. Yes, put, put the camera off. Okay, Luciano, are you listening? I'm having problems with. Okay, uh, you you put the camera off. I think the the connection is better. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, so, uh, Nestor, no, no, Nestor uh, is not here now, but uh, he he talked about the um, the results that the only using the flocculant. Uh, you uh, have a very nice result, so he think it's very unexpected because, but it's uh, uh, it's only in the water because we have to to see the removal of the biomass, no? Okay, only by the application of of flocculants in our story uh, make the the biomass. Uh, Yeah, his connection is very, very difficult. So I will, I will have to, I will have to move on because our time is running now. So uh, the, the, the reply to this uh, Nestor 
question it's like uh, because this is a microcosm scale in a tube for verify the reduce of the biomass. So in this way, the flocculants uh, were very nice alone. Also ve was very nice too with the, the clays, but the, uh, the result was nice alone too. So I will move on because we have our time. So uh, the other uh, work by uh, the engineer technique is control of internal phosphorus fertilization through the application of coagulants and clays in water and the sediment of a semi arid reservoir susceptible, susceptible to resuspension. So from Erika Cavalcanti and the other authors. The aim of this paper was to evaluate the efficiency of application of coagulants and clays in reducing other biomass in, and in controlling internal loading of phosphorus uh, in a neotrophic reservoir in the semi arid region. So two uh, hypotheses, the combination of coagulant and clay have greater efficiency than the isolate effect of the product in the sedimentation of algal biomass and inactivation of phosphorus in the sediment to controlling internal fertilization. Resuspension caused release of phosphorus from the sediment event after the application of coagulants in place, damming the capping layer and consequently the inactivation of phosphorus in the sediment. So the experiment was in three steps. First one, uh, blocking single uh, assays at a microscope scale two. The um, step two, phosphorus capping, and step three, resuspension simulating. Uh, she used a coagulant, um, a pack, a coagulant uh, a commercial, uh, and an organic one, some flock, and a clays, um, a modified bentonite with lanthanum, uh, and a natural bentonite. So, this is the, the main results of the, the experiment uh, of Erica. And some highlights, both coagulants show, show that good results in experiment one, blocking sink, but the pack showed reducing the reductions in phosphorus and cyanobacteria that were much more expressive than the flock, the organic uh, flocculant. Despite uh, being dis uh, dispensable in the reduction ancient bacteria in the water, uh, 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 lanthanum um, modified bentonite is indispensable in the capping technique, while natural bentonite did not present significant minimization in the release of phosphorus from sediment. And about the resuspension after the resuspension simulation, all treatments showed an increase of phosphorus even minutes after the agitation, showing that the technique is vulnerable if the applied uh, environment suffers from recurrent sediment resuspicion events. So I will stop here. And uh, Erica, uh, you are here. I'm here. We, we, are, we start. Uh, with a question from Fernanda. Wait a minute, we'll put it here in the chat. Okay. And Fernanda, would like to read or uh, can I read? You would like to read? Yeah, okay. okay. Hi, Erica. I know I'm suspicious, but I like it a lot. Uh, what was the year of the collection? I saw in Hayan's work that in 2017, Boqueron was dominated by microcystis and in his um, by Hapioxus. And if it was when the reservoir was even less transparent, this only confirms the passage of dominance with the community of the drugs. 
Another question is whether you notice any morphological damage in the cyanobacteria after applying the technique. Could you see it under the microscope? Hi, hi everyone, and thank you for the question. Uh, uh, the sampling year was 2018, uh, more specifically October 2018. And yes, I, I, we were still suffering the consequence of the drought né, in semi-arid region. Actually, uh, only in 2019, the reservoirs in semi-arid region of Brazil uh, began to recover their water volumes. And um, the 30 question, I collected uh, samples to analyze the phytoplankton after uh, applying the technique, but unfortunately, I didn't do the analysis because uh, there was a, a problem in, in storage of the samples, uh, making its use uh, unfeasible. Uh, but the research group, our research group, will carry out other experiments on a mesocosmo scale and the effect of the products on the organisms uh, will be evaluated. <laughs> okay, Erica. Uh, here we have another question from Lawrence. Lawrence would like to read the question I put in the chat. Um, thanks, Erica. Um, I'm curious that you got different results from Jose. He found mm -hmm. that there was no effect. Of, so maybe that's a question as well. But I, I just wondered whether you have any idea of how long the treatment is effective for and how frequently you have to reapply. Uh, actually, I don't know. Uh, our, our group research... Uh, make it the experiments in microcosmos scary, uh, scale already. So in, in, in larger scale, I, I don't know, we, we, we didn't know what. Okay. The thing that I will complete a little bit, the, the most important that this technique, this geoengineering technique, it has to be applied when we close it the external loading. So this is, is not yeah. sense to uh, input uh, some uh, uh, technique uh, that's a very um, cost, cost uh, technique economically mm -hmm. if you don't uh, close the external loading. So the, the first thing is like this. So the, your question about the frankly, frankly uh, how to apply uh, if you use you use this technique, closing the external loading, and you know calculated with the the dynamic of the phosphorus, the balance using the phosphorus uh, forms in the sediment bio available. Uh, I think that is not to 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 apply frequently, but okay. if you have some uh, input of external loading, of course the phosphorus in, uh, entering the system uh, and you have another amount of phosphorus different than the doses that was applied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so it's very dependent on external loading. Exactly. Okay. Vera, you hands up. Yeah, just to, to complete and to, to Lawrence, to Lawrence, uh, um, the longevity of this technique has been measured in a Dutch lake uh, from the Michael Lurling group. And uh, I, I don't remember, but I think they, 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 they are now, uh, uh, the lake now after the, the application is 10 years, 10 years uh, before. And they did one application in some moment. And uh, now it's uh, the, the cyanobacteria are coming very slowly again. 
but uh, is it's not uh, uh, so short. This is in a in a whole lake experiment, and mm -hmm. so it's not uh, and like the the presentation here that are in in small scale. Okay, so it's some it's somehow uh, long, uh, but we don't have too many information about the. This. Yeah, I think it's the only work, no, Vera? It's the only work that has this, this long time. No, after. there is another one in Netherlands too. The, the, another uh, research uh, showing, I don't remember how many years, but some years. Yeah. Uh, it uh, is it, uh, stay, it's still clear. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, yeah. we did just a whole like experiment in Scotland as well uh, with Brian Spears and colleagues. And yeah. we didn't find it in an isolated lake as well but we didn't find it lasted i think we had to reapply in three or four years time or something but, but what about the external loading is it still occurring no it's a isolated, isolated. system ah, I, I do i wonder if it's affected by ph or alkalinity and these things affect it as well yeah, each lake is one lake. This is the yeah, the right. major uh, history, I can say. And we have in lots this, of pets, lots this of specific, fish. Yes, in this specific case, no, uh, we don't don't know. Uh, it's lake is is a unique lake. Yes. So thank you, Erica. We will move on. Uh, I I. I saw another question. Okay. Uh, you, you saw another question, so uh, let me see. Uh, the, in the Moodle. Uh, in the, uh, yeah, because it's from Nestor, but Nestor is not here now. And oh. after you can uh, reply in the Moodle for, the, for, for, for here, okay? Oh, okay. Because uh, I think that he, uh, his connection is... <laughs> Uh, also, uh, okay, okay, so uh, let me see. Okay, I don't know if Nestor it is. So, uh, uh, another uh, in the last one from uh, technique um, the engineering, uh, Fernanda Monicelli and co authors. Possible absorption potential of natural adsorbent materials to control eutrophication. Uh, the aim of this work was to evaluate the fossil absorption potential of three natural adsorbents in semi arid regions. So uh, the, 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 the aim is to find uh, a less cost uh, alternative using natural clays uh, from semi uh, So these three, uh, um, three clays were, uh, uh, was um, investigated, planosol, luvisol, and shalita tailing. The three uh, had a subsection potential with high uh, subsection capacity. The the soluble reactive fossil absorption potential of the natural adsorbent was high at pH 8. This pH is a, a natural pH uh, in the systems in the semi arid region. The precipitation process was probably the main sorption mechanism, being more expressive than adsorption. And the salita tailing was the most promising material for eutrophic environments because it's alkaline calcium rich and con contains a uh, little organic matter. So I will stop here. Okay, uh, I think if Fernanda, we have uh, a question in the chat. I will put here the first one. The first one uh, is from from Erica, Erica would like to read the question. So, uh, 
congratulations na, uh, on the video and the work. And among the soils of you studied, which one do you think is most promising? And uh, also, are you still or will you do more studies with the soils? Thank you, Erica, for the question. Uh, about the first question, I think that all soils are promising for an application. But if I had to choose just one today, I will choose Shelit Stainer. Not one due to the maximum absorption capacity because they all have high values, but due to the characteristics of the absorbent. There is no organic matter, and the phosphate binds to calcium and magnesium, forming a more stable compound in our environment of alkaline pH and anoxia. Because we know that iron can be released in, in anoxia, and this is a very common process in our senior. About the second question, if I am still working with the soils, Yes, I am still working with these soils, now in my PhD in ecology, together with my research group. But now I am focused on observing the effect of these materials on plankton, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and picoplankton, in microscale and also in mesocosms next year. Uh, all of these in semi arid environments. While other laboratory friends study the water quality, cycle of carbon, and epiphytes, and we are very excited for this experiment. Yes, have a lot of work to do, no? So, uh, yes. another it's a comment from Nestor. Nestor would like to do this comment? Yeah, uh, sorry, I have a, a big mistake in my computer. I come back. Uh, Fernando, I like very much your uh, contribution, and I think it's a very interesting uh, research topic because um, I, th I believe that exists a very good alternative in terms of the natural clays, and, and uh, your evidence demonstrates that is possible, it's not a theoretical idea, and in this sense, I'm, I'm very happy about your contribution and I like very much. I want to say you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. We uh, I think so too. <laughs> yeah, we Thank now you. Uh, you study uh, why um, if this soil has uh, some uh, problems in the by in the biota, no, in the with uh, zooplankton and and in the uh, case case trophic. So uh, we are excited to, to see what happens. Because I just, it, uh, talk, talk, I, remember. I just wanna say uh, we need open, open our boxes because we need the, uh, the necessity in put all answers in boxes, but it's not okay. Né? We uh, can open our minds to alternative uh, soils, materials uh, that we can find in the world. Thank you, Fernanda. And so uh, it's almost uh, noon, but we have time to the last, the last one. I, I, I have a, um, a, an additional uh, minor comment that is so important. Okay. That, okay. that, that I think the strategy that you are exploring is, is, is quite, quite relevant in, in, er, uh, in areas like Natal. Uh, because the natural soil in this area, the, 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 the organic matter content is very low uh, in, in comparison with the Pampas area or other uh, region. And in this sense, we must pay attention because in arid region, I think it's a, a, a very good alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Nessa. Uh, okay. So it's here.
the left one uh, it's a biological connection uh, uh, can nutrient release and or consumption by native devolves uh, the uh, I don't know this this the the name of this species parallelopipedon parallelopipedon <laughs> gracias but phytoplankton can bacterial development uh, by uh, Candidilia and Nestor Mateo. So it's a very nice paper about uh, the role of the valves. Uh, the aim of this study is to understand the role of native bivalves, diplodome, parallelepipedome, or phytoplankton dynamics by grazing and or nutrient excretion. So uh, it's very nice to let that have a two experiments, one about the phytoplankton consumption uh, with, with microcystis and cryptophytes, and another one about the experiment of nutrient expression, expression of uh, the bivalve. So uh, the results indic indicated that uh, these bivalve species show it a uh, differential grazing pressure on phytoplankton. Phylepipedon uh, was not able to consume scum forming uh, microcystis, probably due to this biancy uh, control capacity. However, the filtration activity was not inhibited by uh, microcystis presence. During the experiment, when the a uh, palatable alternative food was provided, a strong filter feeding was detected, uh, the predation in cryptophyte. And expre uh, expression uh, rate, mainly of ammonia as SRP, suggests that devolving may play a key role on nutrient recirculation. So the take home message, I'll, I'll talk together, I'll talk together the experimental evidence provide her confirm the hypothesis that the this bivalve activity may promote cyan bacteria blooms, both direct and indirect mechanisms. So uh, Soledad, are you here? Hello. 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 Uh, my camera is not working, sorry, I'm so sorry, but oh, I am okay. here. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I, we I have, have no comment on Moodle platform, and okay. in this sense, I suggest to open okay. the question. Thank you, Nestor. Someone? Uh, I have a question. It's more a curiosity. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I want to put here. Uh, have a proliferation of these bivalve in, uh, in in the the area that you study. You have some uh, because have a, a lot of proliferation of the the, uh, the exotic bivalves. No, have a lot of problems with that. If with your your uh, species studies have uh, some uh, studies of proliferation of this bivalve. Because uh, you put in your work that it can be a big problem uh, because can uh, induce it the the blooms of microcystis. No, so if we have a proliferation of this bivalve, we have a more more problem. No. Okay. In the South Lagoon, there are three uh, bivalves: one native, Diplodon parallelopipedon, and others. Corbicula fluminia and Limnoparna fortunae, there are exotics. Actually, in the lagoon, there are a, a distribution of this bivalve is uh, irregular and in low proportion. So uh, it's a possibility the, the diplodon can uh, promote bivalve. That its experiment was in laboratory. In the child, we don't know. Okay. Uh, a comment by yeah, yeah. Go, can, go on, on, on. <laughs> yeah. Come on, come on. 
No, thank you. Uh, a comment by Lawrence. Lawrence would like to do the comment. Oh, I, I can do. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it wasn't really a question. It's just that in Ireland, where they've had invasive zebra mussels, yeah. they've seen uh, an increase in cyanobacteria and they didn't really understand why. So that's why I'm saying it's really good to see these sort of experimental studies to understand the process, how that's happening. So I think it's a really nice study. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Evaldo. Hi. Evaldo. Um, Hi, Evaldo. Uh, cool, cool results. Um, actually, I was curious. I, I apologize. I haven't watched your talk, uh, but I'll definitely check it out later. But I was wondering, so uh, I don't know that much about bivalves, but what I know is that their kind of selective feeding happens after they kind of sucked in particles and they internally select the particles and then they ingest what they don't want and you know ingest whatever they want. So I was wondering what the consequences are for, for example, um, like colonies of microcystis, whether they are like, they get out deformed or if they're intact after they are ingested. And if you have like any information about that. Sorry, uh, the final question I don't understand. Uh, sure. S's and pseudo S's I release by bivalves and they uh, rest on the sediment. So these pseudo S's and, uh, have nutrients who are li uh, lived to release to the column what the water column. I don't uh, know your question exactly. Yeah, in, in relation to your question, Evaldo, that the, the first part is related to the selectivity in terms of the side particles, and uh, it's, it's important to take into account that uh, in terms of the phytoplankton pressure, um, don't exist uh, any selectivity in, in relation to the size of the species. And is quite important in terms of the selection in the case of the zooplankton because uh, some species with a very good uh, capacity uh, uh, can avoid the the, the, great, the, the predation uh, pressure. On the other hand, Evaldo, it's quite important to remember that in the case of diplodon as well as uh, Corbicula flominia, exotic species, uh, 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 present two main mechanisms of uh, food uh, consumption. One is related to the filtration, and the other, so that is the mechanism related to the consumption of organic matter from the sediment that you can read pedal in feeding. the as pedal uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, another a great point about diplodon is it's uh, diplodon can consume dispersal bloom of Plantotrix agardi, who has a big uh, alga. In this case, a mac there are in surface water, so diplodon cannot be consumed because uh, buoyancy of mac. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if the dispersal, if the bloom is dispersal, diplodon could be it. Okay. Thanks. And, 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 and I want to connect the, the, the Lawrence comment previously that uh, the uh, this species uh, zebra uh, mussel, uh, Dreisena polymorpha, if I don't remember a bad, is, is quite similar to the golden mussel, uh, Limnoperna fortunae. And, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, Limnoperna fortunate actually arrived to Rio de la Plata Basin 20 years ago and dominate completely Paraná River and Uruguay River with a strong effect on the trophic web structure, but also on the dynamic of the turbidity, the inorganic turbidity, and at the same time in terms of indirectly promoting the cyanobacteria bloom, especially 
all the species that regulate the position in the water column. And, and, and it's, it's quite interesting. I didn't know before that you have the same problem in Ireland. <laughs> Okay, everyone, uh, it's past uh, noon o'clock. So uh, I'm really, really happy that this section was very, very nice and useful, I think. Uh, thank you all, the, stay here. And tomorrow we continue the discussion and more about biological uh, techniques and uh, biological response. Have a nice day and see you tomorrow, okay? Thank you, thank you, Nestor, to sharing thank with you, me Vanessa. this coordinating. So, thank you, Nestor, thank you, Vanessa. Ciao, ciao, ciao nice ciao. to see you. A big see hug. A big hug. <laughs> bye. Bye bye, everyone. Ciao, ciao. See you tomorrow. Huh? See you. See you. <laughs>